Good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to virtually welcome you all to Tulane for this exciting evening. While I wish we were gathering here in person, I know tonight's presentation will be engaging regardless of physical location. I'm Kimberly Foster, Dean of the School of Science and Engineering here at Tulane. The School of Science and Engineering is an interdisciplinary school with 11 departments, 16 undergraduate programs, and 11 minors. Just over one third of Tulane's undergraduates have majors in SSE. In addition, SSE has over 520 graduate students, many of whom undertake interdisciplinary research. Our activities in teaching, research, and service are aligned with Tulane's three pillars, groundbreaking research, outstanding educational opportunities, and positive societal impact as evidenced by the translation of Tulane's motto, not for oneself, but for one's own. A number of our academic departments have faculty whose research focuses on the link and relationship between the environment and society, especially the departments of ecology and evolutionary biology, the Department of River Coastal Science and Engineering, and the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. There are many convergent research efforts going on that cross the boundaries between those departments and between schools at Tulane, allowing even more impact on the most challenging problems facing our society today. Tonight's, pro tonight's activity fo focuses on, on one such project. The relationship between the environment and society has been rocky as of late. Record temperatures, record name storms, we're all, all too familiar with that. Record fires, coral and rainforest die-offs, and a global pandemic that most likely jumped from wild animals to humans. Addressing environmental issues such as these requires an interdisciplinary approach that links across human and natural systems. This challenges traditional university structures and requires innovative out-of-the-box approaches that Tulane prides itself on. Tonight, we showcase one of our own um, the, from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Dr. Jordan Carubian, whose work in Ecuador embodies the ideal of linking interdisciplinary research and innovative education to move the needle on environmental issues. Um, I could take up all the time we have tonight listing Jordan's achievements, so I will limit myself to just a few. Um, he has numerous national and international awards for societal impact that include poverty alleviation, reserve establishment, and conservation of endangered species. He has uh, received over $3 million in extramural grants, of which $2 million has just come in in the last year. He has several dozen peer-reviewed publications. He has, four, he has uh, supervised over 40 independent study projects, including 13 honors theses and four student authored publications. Um, and that, that's a very impressive statistic for um, undergraduate authors. He's also supervised 12 uh, master's and PhD graduate students. And four of those students have received the, the prestigious National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship very prestigious national fellowship, uh, allowing them to study, uh, have their educational experience costs covered um, by the National Science Foundation. And he has provided study abroad experiences for 60 Tulane undergraduates through a popular summer field course program. So to kick things off for our exciting evening, I would like to introduce our moderator, Zoe Diaz-Martin. Zoe is originally from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and got her bachelor's in 2012 from Connecticut College. She graduated from Tulane with her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology last year and is now a researcher at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Welcome Zoe, we're so excited to have you with us tonight. Take it away. Hi everyone, thanks so much. Uh, as Dean Foster said, I'm Zoe Diaz-Martin and I'm really excited to be moderating tonight's webinar. Please feel free to add questions in the chat throughout the talk. So I completed my uh, PhD work in Jordan Caribbean's lab in what we call the Ecuador project where I studied tropical biology. One really impactful aspect of this project is that we work alongside local residents to promote both scientific research and conservation. This made my experience with the project a really powerful and transformative one. Um, you know, it of course allowed me to develop my skills in conducting science, but beyond that, it really 
pushed me to kind of change the way I see the world. So for example, when I first started working in Ecuador, I was really only there for the tropical forest. I loved hiking and getting muddy, seeing cool animals like birds and monkeys. A lot of the species were in or are endangered and really only found in that region, which was really cool. And so I would get kind of angry when I would see that people were clearing their forest, a special forest for agriculture. But you know, after living and working with local people, I began to understand the sobering reality that the forest was being cleared because of a lack of economic alternatives, right? I mean, if I were faced with the options of preserving a tree or feeding my family, I would probably choose the latter. So this really, you know, humbled me and pushed me to think outside of the field that I was trained in and to really apply an interdisciplinary approach to conservation. I began working with a local family to help them uh, develop a little ecotourism reserve on their property, which is still up and running today. I was also able to share a lot of these experiences with other uh, Tulane students. And it was just really cool to see you know, how their experiences changed their perspectives as well. This is really a unique project that impacts everyone who gets involved. During my time at Tulane on the Ecuador project, I received the National Science Foundation uh, Fellowship. At graduation, I was also awarded a, um, an award for excellence in my dissertation research, as well as the Tulane 34 Award. And so reflecting back, you know, I can really see how my time at Tulane in SSE and working with Jordan gave me the skills to pursue a career in conservation work and conservation science. And I'm now continuing that work with the Chicago Botanic Garden. But enough about me, I would now like to introduce Jordan Carubian. He is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Tulane and runs the Carubian Lab. He is an exceptional academic who is also committed to coming down from the ivory tower to promote real world change. Take it away, Jordan. Well, thank you so much, Zoe. And thank you also, Dean Foster, for those um, kind words and, and great introduction. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to everybody for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, learn a little bit about the, the work that we're doing. And I'm just really thrilled to share it with you. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and um, share my screen. Let's see here. Okay. Um, so tonight, what I'm going to do for the next, you know, 15 or 20 minutes or so is take you on a, on a tour of a place called the Choco, which is a biogeographic zone. It's a region of the planet um, that's nestled between the Pacific Ocean to the west and the Andes Cordillera to the east. Um, so it's a very narrow, thin band of habitat that runs from southern Panama through Colombia and down into the northern part of Ecuador. And it's a really fascinating, um, understudied and underrecognized, but really, really fascinating area. It's, it's known for its exceptional biodiversity. So if you were to walk through the forests, um, you would see creatures like this and, and many, many others. And notably, it has an exceptionally high rate of endemism. Um, here's some species that are endemic, which means that they're found in this region and nowhere else in the world, which of course adds to the conservation value of, of this habitat. And along with this incredible flora and fauna, there's also a dense human population that lives in this area. And in many cases, as Zoe alluded to, these people lack alternatives to deforestation and hunting to put food on their tables. So, you know, this combination of high diversity, high endemism with species found there and nowhere else, and also a high um, human population density um, has led to a, a conservation crisis in this area, a real issue for biodiversity, where this is one of the 25 hotspots that were initially recognized on the, on the planet for um, importance for the conservation of biodiversity. And to give you a sense of the scope of this issue. Here's a, a, a figure that appeared in a paper that came out almost 30 years ago that shows how deforestation has proceeded in Western Ecuador. And you can see from 1938 to 1988, the forest, which is shown in the stippled areas here, was just absolutely decimated. 
And unfortunately, these trends have still continued through today until you know, well under 10% of the initial forest in Northwestern Ecuador still exists. And it doesn't, you know, it's not too surprising to realize that that's led to um, significant concerns for the conservation of the many species that, that live in this area. So when I finished my PhD from University of Chicago almost 20 years ago, I was really motivated by trying to make a, a difference in terms of, of the way that um, humans interacted with the natural environment. And to get engaged in this, I, I decided to move down to Ecuador. Um, and you know, before I start to talk about my particular experience there, I, I imagine that some of you might be sitting there in, in Louisiana, in New York, on the West Coast, or, or internationally asking, why, why should I care about this? Why is it that what's happening half a world away is relevant to me? And you know, I just want to list a few reasons why I think that, in, especially in today's world, what's happening in Northwest Ecuador is directly relevant to you. And one of the first um, reasons and the most important is, is climate change. Tropical forests are among the most important sinks for carbon on the planet. And what that means is that they're storing large amounts of carbon in these forests. And when the forests are cut down, that releases large amounts of, far of carbon into the atmosphere. And similarly, when these habitats are restored or, or protected, it, it can um, remove large amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. So as we think forward to dealing with the climate crisis that we find ourselves in, tropical forests are of really outsized importance for determining how that's going to play out. A second reason why these are important to you, at least those of us that live in North America, is migratory birds. Shown here is a summer tanager, one of um, nearly 100 species of neotropical migratory birds that um, soon, in the next month ago or so, we're going to start to see moving up from South America and Latin America and into our forests in Louisiana and the East Coast, up into Canada. And, and um, these species, they spend their summers here breeding, but they migrate down to Ecuador and other areas in Latin America over the winter. And they depend upon those habitats to maintain their populations. And in many species of migratory birds, the populations are crashing. And in several cases, that's linked to um, what's going on in their wintering ranges down in South America. So it's a very sort of direct physical link that, that um, ties us to the fate of these forests in Ecuador. And a third reason is, is simply biodiversity writ large. Um, a couple of hectares of rainforest in Ecuador can have more tree species than all of North America combined. And you know, similar outstanding and really kind of mind-numbing levels of diversity in other groups, like frogs shown here, birds, um, insects, et cetera. And um, you know, this biodiversity is of importance to humans. There's there's pollinator services that are provided. There's also you know many um, pharmaceutical drugs were sourced initially from um, rainforest species. And there's tremendous untapped potential for future benefits to humans from this biodiversity. And then also on maybe a more philosophical or personal note, but one that I think that many people here in attendance tonight will also you know, feel some connection to is that many of us feel that there's an inherent value in biodiversity um, and that these species also have a right to, to continued existence. So you know, back almost 20 years ago, I went down to Ecuador with the intention of trying to, to, to make an impact for conservation in this, in this compelling area. And to do it, I decided I was going to study this bird shown here, the long wattled umbrella bird. A wattle is a fleshy appendage that hangs from um, you know, the neck or, or face of, of an animal, a bird in this case, like a turkey's wattle. And in this case, the wattle is feathered and it's quite long. You can see here, it's, it's longer than the, than the bird's actual full body length. And I was fascinated by this endangered species of bird, which had never really been studied before. Um, and somehow its fate was tied to the, to the fate of these forests that it depended on. So I thought by studying this species as an ecologist, by determining its home range and habitat requirements and publishing those papers and giving talks at scientific conferences in the United States and, and beyond, I would somehow be able to achieve meaningful conservation in this area and for the species. But after having been there for a few months, I had a, a, a real a moment of epiphany, 
which occurred when I was walking down a muddy track along with a young boy shown here who had shown a lot of interest in our work. He was bright. He was, you know, obviously interested in the animals and the research that we were doing. He asked all sorts of exciting questions. And we came across this anteater shown in the other image here, which is a, um, you know, a species that is really not harmful in any way to, to humans. Um, it doesn't destroy crops, it's not aggressive, et cetera. And somebody had attacked it with a machete. And you can see here the wounds that this animal was carrying with it. It was really, for me, a heart-rending moment. And full of emotion, I turned to this young boy and I said, isn't this a terrible thing that this has happened to this poor animal? And he looked back at me and said, no, he, he didn't really see it as a negative thing. And it, at that moment, a flashlight or a flash a bulb went off in my mind and I realized that without meaningfully engaging with the local residents in this area, without understanding their value system and their what's important to them and trying to work together to find a way to allow them to conserve um, biodiversity and also take care of their own you know, necessities and requirements, that, that I could do all the scholarship in the world that was never really gonna have a meaningful impact for conservation. So for me, that was a very powerful moment that really illuminated my path forward from that. And, you know, fast forward to, to the current day, we, what I did is I started working in a, in a very close and um, mutually respectful way with local residents from this area. I was able to get some funding to provide them with salary um, and take them from, you know, provide them with the opportunity to stop providing for their families by deforesting and hunting and actually earn a salary by um, you know, studying na natural systems and biodiversity and acting as advocates for conservation and education. And over time, we were able to develop this model to form an Ecuadorian NGO named FCAD, um, which today has full-time, has 12 full-time employees and an annual operating budget of a couple hundred thousand dollars. And it's been had a close partnership with Tulane um, for over a decade now. And the mission of FCAT, this Ecuadorian NGO, is to conserve threatened species and critical habitat by promoting the well-being of human residents in the tropical Andes. And the vast majority of the members and employees of FCAT are, in fact, local residents from this project area where we are working. And so together, FCAT and Tulane have, have established and created an award-winning model for community-engaged research. And the way that this model works is that we conduct publication-grade research, which means we publish our findings in peer-reviewed scientific journals. The research is conducted by teams of local residents that, that receive employment and training for this, together with students and researchers from Tulane and other institutions, both in Ecuador and internationally. And this research serves to build capacity and also provide valuable information that anchors integrated educational programs and, yield ec and yields meaningful economic benefits that are linked to conservation. And you know this project now it's it's been going for um, you know well over nearly two decades now, and it's had some really significant impacts um, in terms of the local impacts. It's it's had a transformative effect on dozens of local residents who've again received full time employment and been able to pursue alternative livelihoods. In some cases, working in the project for you know over a decade. In other cases, using it as a stepping stone to get jobs with the Ministry of the Environment, to go on to further their education, um, including going on to university and master's degrees. Um, it's also helped to provide a meaningful educational program for local communities and also for income diversification, which I'll circle back around to talk about in a minute. And as Dean Foster alluded to, and, and, and um, it's also had significant impacts for Tulane and it's and the two pillars of, of, of education and scholarship that are, are such an um, important part of Tulane's mission. In terms of student training, there's been you know, well over 100 Tulane students that have traveled down to the site in Ecuador to participate in field courses or independent research projects. There's also been a number of um, PhD and master's thesis projects that have been conducted here. Um, in terms of scholarship, there's been dozens of, of peer-reviewed articles that have been produced by this, many of them, most of them, with local resident co-authors. 
um, you know, hundreds of conference presentations, both by Tulane students and faculty, and, and also by um, local residents themselves who have traveled internationally to present on their own work. And finally, you know, nearly $3 million in federal grants um, to support this research. So I want to give a little bit of an example, if that's okay, about the way that this project works. And to do this, I'm going to go back in time to um, about 2013, where we had done a lot of work in the Bilsa Biological Station, which is shown here in this red polygon. This is a privately owned reserve that contains the biggest chunk of continuous forest in the entire region. And we had studied using this community engaged model, a lot of you know, ecological processes and requirements for, um, for endangered species. And we began to wonder what is going on in these isolated forest fragments that are located on the landscape outside of the Bilsa Biological Station. So when you look at this satellite image, the darker shapes here are forest and the lighter green areas are areas that have been deforested for pasture or crop production. So you can see that the area is pretty chewed up in terms of deforestation and yet there are some pretty big chunks of forest that still remain. And it became apparent that nobody had really looked at those forests to determine what their conservation value was. Do they have endangered species in them or not? How diverse are they? How, what sort of ecosystem services might they be providing? And we set out to answer this question using a community engaged approach. So here's a picture of the team or part of the team that went and did this research. And it, it's composed of local resident researchers, um, Ecuadorian students, um, students from Tulane and other US universities, and, and also faculty and postdoctoral fellowships from, from international universities. So it forms a very strong integrated team um, and together, you know, we went out and we sampled over 40 of these fragments for a wide range of, of different sorts of, of animals and plants. And, you know, we did traditional scholarship through this. So we've published over a dozen papers so far from this work that's shown how patterns of diversity vary in terms of the attributes of the forest patches and, um, you know, things like elevation and the amount of um, forest cover on the landscape that are of interest to scientists working around the planet. But at the same time, we were also able to use this research to identify a real world on the ground conservation priority. Or in other words, by characterizing the diversity in each one of these individual fragments, we were able to then rank them in terms of their importance. And we found one fragment shown here by this red arrow that really was a, just a clear conservation priority. Uh, it contained, I'm gonna show you just a few of the species that it contained. It contained this guy, the banded ground cuckoo, which is a, a globally, um, it's, it's considered by the IUCN to be endangered at the global level. And interestingly, one of the closest relatives of this bird is the roadrunner that we have here in the United States. It's a species of bird that just, it can't fly. It runs around the rainforest all day. It's a, really a magnificent species of bird. Um, we've also found this species, um, Blomber's uh, tree boa, which is another IUCN endangered species, which really only has a, a small handful of localities where it's ever been um, recorded in the world, all of them in Ecuador and, and northern, um, I'm sorry, southern Colombia. This species right here, the Mache glass frog, which is a, a species that's, that's also endangered if you look at it, um, it's actually translucent. You can see through to its internal organs if you, if you look at it from the bottom side up, a fascinating species. Um, this species, the Ecuadorian capuchin monkey, it's a critically endangered species of primate that's really restricted to just a few small fragmented areas in, in Northwestern Ecuador. And of course, um, you know, my, my personal favorite or, or, or one of my favorites, at least the long waddled umbrella bird, here we can see a male displaying to a female and um, the male is, is extending the feathers on its waddle and going through a, a series of, of displays which if he's lucky will result in a, a courtship event for that male. So using the information that we, um, that we were able to generate through this scholarship, we were able to convince, you know, leverage this, this information to acquire funding from the US Fish and Wildlife Service to establish a reserve, 164 hectare reserve is what we purchased at the onset, which is shown in this, in this fuchsia polygon right here, um, where 
which has since served as a base of operations for us. We were able to establish that reserve in 2019. <clears throat> we were also able to build a field station shown here from an aerial shot, which serves as a base for um, you know, courses for Tulane students, as well as research programs and community-based um, conservation activities. And this station has capacity for 50 guests. It's safe and comfortable and functional. It has um, electricity and internet and lukewarm showers. Um, we're working our way up to hot showers, but not quite there yet. Um, and it served as a, as a uh, ground now for what's increasingly becoming an interdisciplinary research project that we have there. So as a sampling of some of the types of questions that we're asking research-wise, we're asking um, how, what are the factors that, that influence why it is that local or how it is that local residents manage their land? Why is it that some local residents will cut down all their forests to put in pasture, whereas other local residents will maintain a majority of their forests and use the remainder to, to plant cacao, which can be more friendly for birds, et cetera. So we team up with anthropologists, environmental economists, and sociologists to understand the, the sorts of factors that influence those decisions. And then, of course, with, with the network of researchers that we have, we're able to understand how those management decisions influence you know, ecological integrity and the well-being of the, the ecosystem, patterns of diversity and ecological processes like forest um, regeneration, et cetera. And another question that we have increasingly is, OK, how is it then that these environmental conditions circle back around to affect the health and well-being of local residents? So here again, we team up with medical anthropologists, with workers from public health and environmental economics again, to understand how these nutrition, health, and um, economic endpoints are influenced by these feedbacks between management decisions, the resulting environment, um, and 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 the wealth and the health and well-being endpoints. And then finally, um, or in addition, I guess I should say, we're also implementing a, a very strong focus right now on habitat restoration and using a scientific approach. Um, through sort of a replicated design to ask how it is that we can concurrently maximize benefits of restoration for you know, economic benefits, benefits for biodiversity, and benefits for carbon sequestration. Oftentimes, um, restoration projects focus on one of those, um, and we're taking a, a, a replicated scientific approach to understand under what conditions and using what sort of methods those um, those different endpoints can, can be maximized. So our vision moving forward is to um, continue doing what we're doing and expand on it to establish a corridor. And this is shown in this image right here where um, you can see in the past year from when we got the initial um, 164 hectares in 2019, we've been able to over triple the size triple the size of the reserve in the past year. So now we're sitting at 550 hectares in size, which is, um, which is nearly double the size of Central Park in New York City as a reference point. And our goal moving forward is to continue to acquire um, a, a handful of properties that will allow us to establish a corridor shown in blue here that would allow us to connect Bilsa Biological Station through to a priority wetland for conservation called Laguna de Cube or Cube Lake. It's a, 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 the only rainforest lake that occurs in Northwest Ecuador. It's also a real hotspot for local ecotourism efforts. Um, importantly, I just wanna note that no local residents will be displaced through this corridor establishment, nor have any been displaced through our reserve establishment through, so far. Um, largely people are working this land, but not living on it. Um, and hand in hand with this corridor, which will have the result of protecting uh, roughly 6,000 hectares in total, um, which, is, which will go a long way towards ensuring the integrity of ecosystem function in this area for the long term. Um, we're leveraging the strong community relationships that we have um, to, to promote income diversification and well being of local residents via ecotourism boutique vanilla production and market that's generated by the increasing amounts of research that's happening in this area. And hand in hand with that, 
a real priority for us is to also um, emphasize gender equity in this area and increasing educational opportunities. So kind of tying things together, when back here at Tulane, one of the things that we're, that we're most excited about is moving towards what we're calling the Ecuador program, which I, I personally feel like is really an example of how the contemporary university and contemporary society can really achieve its full potential by blending scholarship, education, and positive societal change with positive feedbacks, um, so, sort of self-reinforcing feedbacks on each of those three pillars of the modern university. And the way that we would do this is by establishing a certificate program for a diverse range of students from across the university. So whether, you know, pulling students from liberal arts and School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, as well as science and engineering, and coming up with a truly interdisciplinary cohort-based certificate program in which students would have the opportunity to link the knowledge that they're gaining in the classroom with hands-on research opportunities in Ecuador and have the opportunity to really see these direct linkages from what they're learning in the classroom, what they're doing through their own independent and, and mentored research, and how that's having a real world impact um, through the conservation programs that we're delivering in, in Ecuador. And so with that, I'd like to just, um, I think I'll wrap up right there and thank you very much. I would like to say before closing that here's my email, jk at tulane.edu. And if you have questions that don't get answered in the Q&A or would like to have further dialogue about this, I encourage you to, to reach out by email. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, stop for now and, and pass off to, um, to, to Zoe. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, it looks like my video isn't working, but um, thanks so much, Jordan, for that great overview. Um, we're now going to hear from three different students who have all worked in Ecuador to discuss um, their experiences. So we're going to start with a video from a student, Lila Pell, who isn't able to join us tonight, but has a pre-recorded video. First off, I had an incredible experience at FCAT. I learned so much and I'm really, really, really glad that I got the opportunity to study in Ecuador with Drs. Carubian and Ribeiro and all of the wonderful grad students um, and a really wonderful close-knit community of eBio students and also a few other majors. So I was on the birds team when we went to FCAT and that means that I was getting up earlier than everybody else at 6 a.m. to go check the mist nets. And um, we ran on a little bit of a different schedule than I'm used to, and that was really cool. And I was on the birds team because I'm really passionate about ornithology. And so we got to study some really amazing tropical birds. My personal project um, had to do with a the difference in a secondary rainforest habitat versus a um, fragmented pasture land. So the FCAT reserve is kind of at the intersection of some cow pasture land, which has been mostly cleared of trees and uh, the secondary rainforest, which is a very thick rainforest habitat. And it is the perfect habitat to study rainforest disturbance and see how the fragmentation of the rainforest might affect different species and their ecology. Uh, so my project focused on the abundance and diversity of different types of foraging birds in the edge of the forest fragment versus deeper into the forest. And this gave me the opportunity to look at the effect of fragmentation on different types of birds. And uh, it was a great opportunity to get some field research experience. So one thing that really stood out to me other than the research itself uh, was something I was really grateful to learn about, which is this focus that the program had on the interaction between human mo motivations and rainforest conservation. And I think a lot of eBio majors have this idea as we go through our major that there are these big corporate villains that are chopping down the rainforest. And we don't realize that a lot of forest fragmentation is just individual families uh, 
they're trying to feed each other and survive and sometimes the forest needs to be cleared to make room for cattle and if that's more fiscally feasible for them then of course they will do that in order to support their families so stuff like that that we got to learn just gave us some more realistic ideas about what we're facing and the delicacy of the issues that we are looking at when we think about conservation. Um, and another really formative part of the experience for me were the nightly talks. Um, we would have these amazing talks that we get to listen to from, you know, Dr. Kruby and Dr. Ribeiro, um, but also people that were working at FCAT, like the cooks and people that had been working with the uh, on the conservation side of things for a while and just uh, community members and also the grad students gave some talks. And so this was obviously a huge swath of different people to hear opinions from and to hear their stories. And so we got to really learn a lot about people in their different walks of life. And I personally learned a lot about what I do wanna do with my future and what I don't wanna do with my future from what I was hearing about uh, grad students experience and PhD programs and what it looks like getting involved in conservation. So it was a very informative experience for me and it was something very, very unique. And I think there's a big need for programs like this in a wonderful university like Tulane. Hi everyone, um, I am Taylor J. Cowan. I am from Houston, Texas, and I graduated from Tulane in December of 2019. Um, and so I'm so I'm sure many of you study eBio or some focus on some science related field, but I actually was a finance and marketing major um, from Tulane. And I heard about the Ecuador project really on accident from a friend. And I would say I had no idea what I was getting myself into or really what to expect. But like Lila mentioned, it really was an experience of a lifetime for me. Um, and it was a huge learning experience um, because I haven't really taken any major science classes since high school. So the learning curve for me was very steep. Um, I think what I enjoyed the most is how immersive the project was. Initially, I wanted to focus my research on the economics of conservation because I thought that was the easiest way to tie my background of business and finance into the Ecuador project. But then I realized that I probably would never get another chance to focus and research a topic that I knew so little about while also being surrounded by amazing professors and researchers and students. And so I ultimately decided to focus on caterpillars and study caterpillar predation. Um, so my project in particular focused on whether the placement of caterpillars on the top of the leaf or on the bottom of the leaf affected their predation rates. And um, we, we studied caterpillars both inside the forest and also on the edge of the forest. And Dr. Renata was my kind of go-to professor because she was over the caterpillar project. And I think having her as a resource and as a guide throughout the entire trip to answer all my questions, so I had a lot of questions, was really an amazing experience for me. And I think having that support system made the project so much more meaningful. Um, but just apart from the research, just being able to wake up in the rainforest every day and you know wake up to birds chirping and leaves blowing, um, and just to be surrounded by so many knowledgeable people was, I guess, what meant, what meant the most for me. Um, and also just being able to hike through the different parts of Ecuador and different parts of rainforest and see how each are different from, you know, the other parts was an amazing experience also. And just seeing the local Ecuadorians talk about their story, I think, opened my eyes to um, the reality that a lot of people face in Ecuador. Um, and even though I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher, I think that this project solidified my, my call to renewables. And I, I hope, hope, hopefully in the future, um, I wanna combine renewables and energy um, with my background in finance and marketing. And now I'd like to pass it over to Sarah. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah. I graduated in May of 2020 from Tulane with a degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I was interested in conservation in my undergraduate career and I still am, but I was interested in getting experience in both field biology and also with a conservation organization. 
This worked out very well when I started to plan my thesis and Jordan told me that the FCAT field station was going to be built around the same time. So I was able to go down and collect data for this for about two months and then participate in the course at the end of the summer. Uh, getting to do this research was probably some of the most intensive and rewarding research that I could have done at Tulane. Uh, what started out as a honors thesis is now in its final stages of getting ready to be published. So fingers crossed there. Um, but getting to see this through regardless of the end result has helped me develop the skills necessary to um, do field biology projects in a pretty comprehensive way. I recognize this, but this was also recognized by the eBio department at Tulane with the Fred R. Cagle Memorial Prize Award. Um, and I know it was instrumental in helping me get the job that I am currently in, as well as helping me succeed in the job that I am currently in. More importantly, however, um, this experience really changed the way that I view conservation. Before this in my education, I had kind of been getting the, uh, the idea that people in conservation don't work well together. And sometimes this, this can be the case as we all know, but um, however, I really got to see the other side of this, um, the positive side of this when I was there um, through getting to work with local residents, doing data collection, through studying the sociological aspects of conservation in the course, and through just learning and observing how FCAT runs, uh, I got to see how um, there can really be a positive side between people and conservation. With real creativity and care, as you've seen, uh, FCAT can weave together community and conservation in a way that uh, continues to inspire me today. Running an organization like this now seems very obvious to me, but it really took me being on the ground experiencing it to get it through that this is the way that things can be done and should be done. On my conservation career path, I know this has and will continue to make me a more caring, effective, and conscientious practitioner. After graduating, um, when I have wanted to donate to organizations, uh, FCAT is often at the top of my list. Um, my experiences there changed the way I view conservation, helped catalyze my career, and I am so excited about the future of this organization that it's a very easy choice to make. Uh, there are so many caring and um, good intentioned people at Tulane looking to make a difference for both people and the environment. And I know that this organization and this program can be part and parcel for helping people do this just like it was for me. And with that, I will bring it back to Zoe to kick off our Q&A. That was great. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful students for sharing their experiences with us. Um, I loved hearing from Lila, even though she wasn't able to be with us um, in person tonight. So let's go ahead and open up um, the Q&A. So if you have, again, any questions, you can uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. Unfortunately, well, we have a lot of great questions coming in. And unfortunately, we probably won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but we will save the chat and try to um, make sure to answer all of the questions after the webinar. So I'm going to start with a question. Um, do people live in the biosphere reserve? Oh, Jordan, I think you're muted. Thanks, I think I'd be used to Zoom by now. <laughs> um, yeah, people do live in the biosphere reserve. The, the, the work that we're doing is much of it is located within the boundaries of a of an Ecuadorian federal reserve, which would be similar to like a national park in the United States in terms of the way that it's it's the what it what it looks like in the law books. Um, but unfortunately, the reserve was established in the early 1990s at a time when there was already several thousand people living within the boundaries of the reserve. So there's a real disconnect between, you know, what it says on paper in terms of the, the reserve and, and what's actually happening on the ground. Um, so, you know, working with the local residents in this area is really, um, I think, a fundamental, a fundamental need. 
there's very little enforcement on the ground of, of the laws that should in theory be in place. Um, another question we have is, um, any idea how to scale the benefits of this project to a larger population? That's a great question, you know, and oftentimes with a lot of the funding sources that we get, especially from foundational funding sources, um, there's a lot of interest in scaling and, and replication. And it's something that we've thought about a lot. And it's a tricky question for us because the, the, the core of our project is the, is the community engagement. It's the strong relationships that we have with the local residents that really, in, in some ways, go back to the fact that, you know, at the, at the genesis of this, of this project, I, I lived in this site for, you know, five or six years, basically full time, and was able to establish these relationships of, of trust and mutual respect, which in many ways still continue to be the, the foundation of the project through today. So it's not the kind of thing where we can just pick this up and, and try to replicate this model in, you know, in, in another region without doing that work and spending that time developing those relationships. But having said that, you know, what we are working actively to do is to expand the scope of this out regionally. So in that sense, expand the geographic scale. Um, there's a number of partner um, organizations that are working in Northwest Ecuador. Um, Fundacion Hokotoko is one. Third Millennium Alliance is another one, and there's a number of other partners um, that we are working with or seek to work with to replicate um, the, the community engaged pieces that, that we've been able to develop in these neighboring reserves that are in the same sort of geographical and, and cultural um, area. Kind of in a, a similar vein, another question is, have you spent time uh, looking for corporate investors to help acquire land? No, I feel like we should be able to do that, but I haven't really known where to start. Tulane has a, you know, within Tulane's um, development or now called advancement office, there is an office of, of corporate relations and I'm in touch um, with with the representatives from Tulane to try to make those relationships. But as of yet, we haven't had any luck on that front. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, are you going to Ecuador this summer and do you accept high school students? <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are hope, you know, as everybody is so aware, there's, there's so much, um, uh, you know, flexibility is the name of the game and uncertainty, I guess, too. So we aspire to go down to Ecuador. We, um, we certainly hope so, but that would depend on many things, including, you know, students being vaccinated prior to going down, et cetera. Um, there's also some significant concerns about even if, you know, we as, as citizens of the U.S. are able to get vaccinated before going down there, it's unlikely that the local residents in this area will be vaccinated. So, um, having said that, you know we've we feel like we've come up with a with a um, a game plan to be able to travel down there safely and minimize risk. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to do it, but there's still some uncertainty. And we have had high school students come down in the past to work with us, although not in the context of the course that we lead, but more as as sort of uh, research interns, let's say. Kind of on a also a related type of question is, do you take volunteers to help your efforts in Ecuador and how can alums help? Great question. Yeah, I mean, we, we would love to have volunteers. We're set up to receive volunteers. Um, so we would, we would appreciate having volunteers of all ages come down to um, get integrated and involved in the project. And there's a variety of different, you know, sort of opportunities and ways that that could play out. And then, you know, other ways that alums can um, can participate. One is spreading information about this program by word of mouth. Another is, you know, through networks or directly um, helping to make donations that can say, give a scholarship for uh, a Tulane student to be able to go down and participate on this course or, or research or to help an Ecuadorian student um, be able to go to college or to help with land purchase. Those are all, you know, possibilities. 
there's plenty of need down there. Yes, great. Um, here's a little more in-depth question. Um, what are the main obstacles about achieving this corridor? At this point, the main obstacle is really financial. We need to raise the money to purchase the land. We anticipate that we have in direct land purchase costs, we have about a million dollars that are required um, to establish the corridor, which would mean tripling our reserve again from the size of, to put it in acres. Right now we have about you know 1,500 acres and we would expand out to about 4,500 acres. And we could achieve that with about a million dollars in in cash to acquire the land. And hand in hand with that, um, you know, we really see integrating societal programs as, as a key component of this project as well. So we don't see the land purchase as the only piece of it. There's also projects that really need to be developed in terms of building capacity for ecotourism and vanilla, vanilla production is another project that we've identified to help to ensure that this conservation action raises all the ships in the area and, and is not just um, you know, for the benefit of nature, but not the local residents. Great. Um, so you, know, you, you talked a little bit, Jordan, about um, public health. And one question is if there's any work uh, being done on tracking how deforestation influences disease ecology. That's a great question. You know, I'm fortunate um, that a, a new hire in our department, Dr. Hannah Frank, um, studies precisely that question. She looks at how um, how bats in particular can serve as vectors for disease and how habitat change can influence them. So together with Hannah and um, an Ecuadorian colleague and a master's student in the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, um, and also an undergraduate from the School of Science and Engineering at Tulane, we're actually going to be implementing a project this summer to look at precisely that question. So we don't have, I would say that there's something that there's a tremendous demand and, and need for that type of research. I mean, now more than ever for obvious reasons, but it's something that we're just kind of getting underway. That sounds like a really exciting uh, collaborative project. I'm gonna um, switch gears a little bit and ask for Sarah and Taylor J. What fun things or places did you do or visit in Ecuador? Um, um, Taylor, yeah, Taylor J, do you wanna start off? Okay, so I think something that is very memorable for me, well, first off, I had not really hiked before, um, and that was an essential part of being in Ecuador, just hiking around. But I think one of the most memorable days was when we went to the Bolsa Reserve and we actually had like a five hour hike um, and that was definitely out of my comfort zone. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to do the long hike, which is five hours or the shorter hike, which is one hour. But um, I just think that the insects and the, and the history that we learned while on that hike was definitely worth it. Um, so I just think all adventures, not only within the reserve, but you know, around Ecuador were amazing. And I don't think I'll ever forget those. Absolutely. And we also got to go to the ecotourism site that Zoe helped set up. Um, and one really fun thing there was we learned how they make chocolate. So we got to see the roasting process and we got to be a part of the peeling of the cacao beans um, and the grinding of it. And we all got to uh, purchase some chocolate to take home at the end. Um, and we also went to the lake that Jordan talked about earlier, which is really incredible um, and a very unique place to be. So those were some of the, the fun things that we, we did on the program. Great, thanks. And so we're gonna um, finish off with a closing question. Uh, my apologies again that we weren't able to get to all of the great questions that everyone shared. Um, so for the closing question, how can we motivate young people to value conservation in their work? I don't know if maybe we can go Jordan, Sarah, then Taylor J. Yeah, I guess as the most removed from being a young person, I'll start out and then we'll get closer to the truth as we, <laughs> as we drill down. Um, I believe that's, that's a really complicated question and I don't think there's any one answer to it, but I believe that, you know, so often in life, you, you, you value what you have, what you understand and what you have direct experience with. And if you don't have direct experience with something, then 
you oftentimes don't really don't really value it that much. And I feel like increasingly our youth are growing up in in what's been called nature deficit disorder you know limited exposure to the natural environment limited exposure to wild places and as a consequence a lack of valuation for that so i think one of the most important things that we can do um, is get people out into natural areas you know to to begin to develop that relationship with the natural environment which i think is likely to um you know, then inform values that are formed. Um, I completely agree with that. I think that getting youth out into nature and um, without that, it can seem kind of scary and removed from yourself. Um, and I think that that contact and ensuring that we aren't just focusing on the, the dis despair is happening in nature because we all know that's happening, but really focusing on um, connection and all the, the positivity that it brings to you as a, a person, a community, a society, and an earth. Um, focusing on that at every level and getting that connection is where I really, really see um, it changing myself and the people around me. I agree. Um, I think the biggest thing is just like making it personable and making people realize that, you know, it's small changes that can have big effects. I know for me, my dad has been really involved in renewables and climate change efforts. So that's personal to me. So like I can see um, the effects in, in, real, in the real world. And then going to FCAT, of course, you see it, you know, on the reserve. So I think just um, exposing young people at a young age to ways or to think of ways to conserve or uh, small ways to change behavior can have, I think, big impacts. Um, but I agree with everything that Sarah and Dr. Rubin said. I also agree with what everyone has said. And I think I'll say that I actually find that Gen Z uh, and younger folks are really interested and passionate about conservation and a lot of the issues that you know we're currently facing. Um, and I think it's more of a question of like harnessing that energy and providing young folks with the experiences and opportunities to promote change. Um, so I guess I just wanna finish up by uh, thanking Dean Foster, uh, Dr. Kerubian, Lila, Taylor J, and Sarah for talking with us today. Um, and thanks to Dr. Kerubian for um, inviting me to moderate tonight. So if you want more information about uh, Dr. Krubian's research and these ongoing efforts, please reach out to Anne Fuselier, whose contact information is here on the slide. Thank you all again for joining us and have a great night.